Well, uh, our second speaker is joining us from the University of Waterloo, uh, Polkit Sinha, who is a student of Ashwin Nayak and will be telling us about optimal bounds for quantum learning via information theory. Take it away. Hi, everyone. So, yeah, I would like to thank the TQC committee for giving me this opportunity. So, before talking about the work, let's talk about a few classical learning problems. So, many problems in classical learning involve the simple structure of you being given an object X, and I ask you whether this object X has some binary property Y or not. Now, a simple example of this is just today's captures. Typically, they tend to ask you whether a given picture has a specific object, let's say a cat in it. Here, the picture is the object X and the property of having a cat in it is Y. Now, a general method that people use to solve these is using label samples to create algorithms that generalize from the label samples. What's a label sample in this case? Well, it's just some images with a cat and some without. With, specific, with the specific labels. Now, in this setting, a question naturally arises is that how many label samples are actually required to have some good prediction power? For this problem, Valiant figured out a formalized setting, which we now know as, which we now know as probably approximate correct learning. And briefly, it's the following problem. Given an unknown function f, a known binary function f, from a class of known functions cal f, such that all of the functions in the class f have the same domain, and you are allowed to ask for random samples of the function f over some hidden distribution d of its domain, and your task is to find an epsilon approximation of f over d. Now, what does an epsilon approximation of f over d even mean? It means you give a, a, a hypothesis tilde f, which agrees with f with a very high probability on this, on this distribution d. And what does random samples mean in this context? A random sample is just the ordered pair f x comma f x, where this is drawn with probability p x, where p x was the probability of drawing x in d. Now, how does this relate to the uh, example I talked about earlier? Here, you can think of f as being the ground truth for uh, which images do have a cat and which images do not. And respectively, the random samples would just be uh, label samples for these images. x would just be the image, and f of x will be the corresponding 0 or 1 value, whether it has a cat or it does not. With this, d can be thought of as the distribution over the label samples. Now, note that this uh, distribution of label samples might have some inherent bias on it. So it's only normal to ask for a guarantee that this depends on the distribution as the prediction you make might itself be biased. Now, this problem of pack learning has been well studied classically and it was found that the sample complexity, which is the number of labels, the random samples needed is exactly theta of D over epsilon, where D is the VC dimension of this class of functions. Uh, briefly, D, or the VC dimension of this class of functions can be thought of as a measure of how fine-grained this class of functions is. Now, Shouty and Jackson considered the quantum version of this back learning problem, where instead of random samples, they considered quantum samples, which are as defined as here. The quantum sample corresponding to F is just the superposition of ket x tensor ket fx with amplitude square root px, where px was the probability of drawing x in the original hidden distribution. Note that on standard measurement, this just gives you the random samples in the case of classical pack learning back. So these quantum samples are at least as powerful as random samples in the sense that any algorithm that uses random samples can be modified to use quantum samples instead. Nonetheless, it turns out that even with these supposedly powerful quantum samples, Arunachal and De Wolf prove that the sample complexity for pack learning as well is lower bounded by D over epsilon. 
In the proof for this, they use tools such as quantum state identification using pretty good measurements and some Fourier analysis. Now, in our work, what we aimed, what we aimed to do was we, we tried to provide simpler information theoretic proofs for the lower bounds for the following problems, quantum path learning and quantum agnostic learning. These information theoretic techniques were also considered by Arunachalam and DeWolf. However, they found that they were not able to get around a log D factor in the lower bounds. In our work, we show, we show that there is indeed a way around that in using this technique. Finally, we also derive bet, uh, slightly better lower bounds for the quantum coupon collector problem, which we discuss later. Now, uh, now I'll describe the setting of the proof, uh, information proof technique in Arunachalam and Devil's paper and see what went wrong there. So first, they considered a classical register A containing a random F from the class of functions. Second, they considered a quantum register BT, which, cons uh, the, which contained uh, the corresponding T quantum samples for the F in A. Note that this uh, assumes and uh, this assumes a choice of an inner hidden underlying distribution, which they had made. So we will not go in there. Finally, they also assume the existence of a black box path learner, which takes in T quantum samples of F and outputs a hypothesis F tilde for F with high probability. So in this setting, what one can do is apply this black box learner chi onto the register BT and then output a hypothesis for the classical register A. Now, the goal here was to sort of come up with a contradiction for smaller values of T to get a lower bound. So let's see how to do that. So step one is to obtain this inequality. Uh, the first equality can be obtained by simply expanding out the mutual information in terms of minimum and entropies. Uh, the middle one is just the data processing inequality. And the rightmost one is obtained by, consider, by considering chi bt uh, as a classical register. And then since A is also classical, uh, you can just use classical information theoretic techniques to obtain this lower bound. Now, once since we have a lower bound on the Weinerman no entropy of uh, B, then all it remains is to show corresponding upper bound on the Weinerman no entropy of B as well. So, and this is how they did it. So over here, the first inequality is obtained by simply taking uh, subadditivity, where SB1 here is just the one of an entropy of B when you only take a single quantum sample. And then the next inequality is obtained by tightly bounding SB1. Note that there's a log D factor over here, and this is the log D factor that leads to uh, not optimal bounds the lower bound. So we found out that instead of going with subadditivity in the uh, first step here, if we instead directly computed out the spectrum of rho b, then we actually do get uh, the uh, optimal lower bounds once we plug in the spectrum into this expression for the one nominal entropy of b. So we found out that the spectrum looks like this. So you have eigen values, lambda it, each, each with multiplicity L sub i, which was equal to d choose i. And you have this for each i from 0 to d. So you have d plus 1, at most d plus 1 distinct eigen values. Once you have this, then the one arm and entropy looks like this. Now notice that there's a log 1 over lambda i term, it term here. We split up that term into two terms, log li and log 1 over uh, li lambda it which leads to a different expression like this now why did we do this we did this because the term on the right now resembles an entropy expression of a d plus one outcome random variable so that's clearly upper bounded by a uh, o log d plus one and on the left side now we have an expression which, which resembles an expectation of a log term over this distribution defined by the li lambda it probability vector so this is how it looks now. Now note that uh, the second term is strictly uh, is asymptotically smaller than D. 
So we don't really care about that since we wanted a lower bound of D. And on the left hand side, the first term uh, is an expectation of log D choose I. And D choose I uh, is maximized at D over 2. So it suffices to, uh, to upper bound this, it suffices to, uh, to prove a concentration of this distribution away from dy2. So this is all for pack learning. Now let's move to the quantum coupon collector problem. First, I'll describe the classical version. Simply put, it's this problem. Suppose there's a hidden set of coupons, it's a hidden set of k coupons, and at each step, you're given a random coupon with replacement from this set of coupons. Now, your task is to collect each of the coupons at least once. If you try to visualize this process of you picking up a random coupon at each step, you'll realize that uh, as you keep on collecting new and new coupons, the probability of collecting a so far uncollected coupons coupon keeps on decreasing. Because of this phenomenon, it turns out that the number of steps you require is k on k plus theta k. And this problem has a very simple analysis. Uh, yeah. Now, you can think of this, pro this process as sort of learning the set S. In the sense that once you have all the k coupons, you in some sense know the set of coupons. With this idea, we can now generalize quantum coupon collector problem to the quantum coupon collector problem. Uh, but before we do that, we need some restrictions on it first. So now consider that the set of k coupons S was a subset of a known set of coupons with of size n. Without loss of generality, let's suppose uh, that set is the first n natural numbers. Then, uh, just like before, we consider the quantum samples instead of the random samples. Now, what does a quantum sample for the set S look like? It's just a superposition over k ties for each i in S. And the superposition is uniform. Now, as before, uh, the quantum samples on standard measurement are going to give you the random samples. However, it was found that uh, it was found by Arnachalam and others that uh, with these quantum samples, you can learn the set S asymptotically faster than classical in certain settings. So they found that the comp the sample complexity of this is exactly k log of minimum of k or n minus k. So in specific, if the uh, size of the complement of S is small then classic then uh, in the quantum version we are asymptotically faster than in the classical version in our work we have shown that uh, the lower bound can be improved as this so we basically have fixed the constant in front of the highest order term that is we have fixed the higher order terms in, uh, itself now let's uh, talk about how we did it so our first try was to try and use the information theoretic argument again from back learning. So as before, we have a classical register A. This time it contains random sets S instead of functions. B will contain the corresponding T quantum samples. And chi will be a learner for S from the quantum samples, from T quantum samples. So you can apply B to get A with high probability. Now, again, the goal is to get uh, some sort of contradiction from some inequalities. So what we aim to use was the data processing inequality itself as in the back learning case. Uh, also, we'll be restricted in the specific, uh, specific re uh, regime. So we'll only consider the case where the size of the complement M is much smaller than N. Now that we have this, uh, so it turns out that using a result in the previous work on quantum coupon collector, you can uh, relate the spectrum of Ruby to a random work on the first M plus one natural numbers. And let's see how that random work looks. So at each stage, you can either move one step ahead, stay at the same place, or uh, move one step back. Also, if you notice the transition probabilities, you'll realize that the back transition is actually actually has a very small probability compared to the rest. So if you ignore this back transition, 
it turns out that this W approximates a variant of the classical coupon collective problem. And uh, with this approximation, we can estimate out uh, the row, uh, the spectrum of rho B because the spectrum of rho B is related to uh, W by this exact relation. Basically, the distribution at the th stage of this uh, random walk is exactly the probability vector ls lambda st, where you had eigenvalues lambda sts and uh, multiplicities ls, where ls was this exact quantity on the bottom right. Now, we have a good hold on the spectrum of rho b. Therefore, we must have a good hold on the mutual information between a and b. However, we find out that it is the other side of the data processing inequality that we do not have a good hold on. Why is that the case? This is the case because even though the known algorithm is uh, has a very high mutual information, uh, that is I, IA IB is high, there are certain adversarial algorithms that perform just as well, but which discard away information in some sense. And let's see an example of how such an adversarial algorithm might look like. So first, uh, consider a black, a black box learner chi. An adversarial learner is going to use this chi to give a new algorithm. Step one, it uses chi to get a guess S dash for S. Then the adversary learner checks using possibly extra samples uh, whether S dash equals to S. Now that this is sample efficient compared to learning S from scratch. Finally, uh, if S dash was equal to S, it outputs uh, S dash. Otherwise, it outputs garbage. Now notice that uh, whenever chi is correct, this adversary learner is also correct. So the adversary learner performs just as well as chi. However, when chi is incorrect, the adversarial learner throws away any correlation there might have been between S dash and S. So when it fails, there's no correlation between the output and the correct answer. This is in stark contrast to the actual working of uh, the known optimal algorithm. This is because when it fails, it fails in such a way that the guess it generates is very close in set difference to the actual set S. So you still have a lot of correlations in the case of failure as well. However, since we have already found out the spectrum of Ruby, we tried to find a method to actually use it to get the lower bounds. It turns out that if you correlate learning the set S with distinguishing between all the uh, T copies of the quantum samples, then you, you can uh, use some early results on distinguish average case distinguishability uh, which were, which were the Hollywood under bounds. By Hollywood under bound, the success probability of the average case distinguishing in our case was upper bounded by this term in the middle. Notice that the trace of the square root of rho b only depends on the spectrum of rho b itself. So once we plug in our estimates for the spectrum of rho b, we get a good upper bound on the success probability and that upper bound on the success probability correlates to a lower bound on the sample complexity, which is what we which, what I described earlier. That is, we fix the uh, constant factor in front of the highest order term. This can be checked to match with the upper bound, uh, the algorithm uh, mentioned in the previous work on this problem. Now, I would like to conclude with the following points. So, we have given quantum path learning lower bounds using information theoretic techniques. Now, what I did not describe here was that the proof for the lower bounds for quantum agnostic learning look very similar to the proof for quantum back learning described here. We also believe that this uh, technique will also work on other problems considered by the work by Arnachal and Mendeville. Next, we found out that our technique doesn't directly work on quantum coupon collective problem. Uh, it turns out that it can work on the quantum coupon collector problem if you consider a more a strict version of the success condition of the learner. Specifically, instead of uh, bounding the probability of S not being equal to S dash, you bound the expectation of 
uh, the set difference of S and S dash. In that case, uh, you do get back the correct bound. Finally, we used a spectrum analysis uh, to give optimal lower bounds for the quantum coupon collector problem using the hollow calendar bound. And with this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. Uh, we have time for questions now. Uh, actually, I had a question. So uh, in your view, does your proof, uh, I guess your reproof of the quantum coupon collector lower bound like kind of simplify things compared to the Aronachalam at all result? Because if I recall correctly, that kind of involved some sophisticated techniques using representation theory. And it looked like maybe this is quite a bit easier to understand. Uh, mm. I wouldn't say so because uh, this relation to this random work actually depends on one of the results. I see. Okay. So, so, you, so you're not completely yeah. circumventing their lower bound. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, well, if not, we can thank the speaker again, and this concludes the session.